Welcome back to Game Geeks, folks. I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Today's episode, Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game. I have had more fun playing Call of Cthulhu than almost any other game out there. I have been playing this for a long time. I've had several iterations of the rule books. I have a huge chunk of their books, of Chaosium's books, in my library. I regret none of my purchases. Folks, this is pretty much one of the first, if not the first, approach to horror role-playing. This takes into effect the works of H.P. Lovecraft, horror fantasist from the 20s and 30s, and essentially applies his work to a game. This is really, really a good, interesting game. The mechanics of it, it is percentile, so you have a percentage chance to succeed at anything. It brings in a nice way to do experience. At the end of an adventure, you mark off every skill that you use, and you want to fail at that roll. If you, if you fail at it, you get to go up in your points. That way, if you're really good at something, it's harder to improve. This is one of the few games where having a skill in Latin, in library use, in speaking Aklo, will serve you much better than shotgun or knife, although dodge is always a nice skill to have. The, what made this different at the time was it introduced a sanity mechanic, which is as you investigate horror, as you investigate the unknown, as you investigate the creepy crawlies that go bump in the night, you start to go unhinged. There are certain things that man was not meant to know, and congratulations, you're looking right in their face. As you go down in sanity, you start to get nuttier and nuttier until eventually you become unplayable. And the character becomes the property of the game master. This defaults to a 1920 setting, which to me is a setting that really has not gotten enough attention, except in the pulp era, in terms of gaming, because it's close enough to modern day that we understand a lot about it, but there are still some differences that make it flavorful. For example, does that roadside Mattel have a phone? Do you have to use a telegraph? And the 1920s really deals with the issue of separation and isolation, two things that are core to understanding how horror works, is you need to be alone. You can't call the cops. You have to be the one or the small group in the haunted house. Now, this version you see in front of you is actually a commemorative version. This is the 25th anniversary of the game, and what's neat about this particular version is the cover of this matches the very first box set that they put out in the 80s. The interior is well designed. The rules have been gone over with a fine tooth comb. If you don't like percentages, if you don't like this basic type of game, then you're probably not going to like this. It does take a rules light approach in that there's a lot of things that are just left up to the, to the game master called the keeper of forbidden knowledge. And it works really well that way. One of the main complaints about Cthulhu Adventures is that they're very railroady in that it's pretty predetermined what you have to do. I think that comes from this being heavily based on a literary source. Yes, in my opinion, a lot of the adventures are very railroady. Oh look, someone died. Oh look, a mystery. A clue, a clue, a clue, a clue. Eek, run, spell, it's done. You know, that's the model for a lot of the adventures. But in my opinion, Call of Cthulhu has never been about deep character development. It's never been about how many monsters you can kill. It's about chills. It's about making your players nervous. It's about getting nervous. It's about enjoying that little frisson of fear as you open a door and not knowing what's on the other side. There are a wide variety of high-quality supplements for this game that you should look into and get your hands on. One of the most recent ones that is particularly nice is this, the Malaeus Monstorum. This is sort of the critter book for Call of Cthulhu. It has a really deep, really interesting set of monsters in here to pull from. In fact, a lot of things you might not think of Lovecraftian, for example, is the Martians from H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds are included in here if you really wanted to use those. One of the things I like that they did with this is that it doesn't... A lot of Lovecraft's monsters were, well, in addition to being unpronounceable, unnameable, or you can't describe it, or it's so horrible that you cannot put it into words, and there are only so many pic squiggly pictures of things with tentacles and eyes and maws that you can really draw. The art in this was they took existing pictures or barely photoshopped pictures, wood cuttings, historical documents, and changed them 
just enough where you have to look at them and go, wow, that's really bizarre. There were a couple of these I looked at and was sort of like, okay, where did they change this? Because it looks so real. It's great for giving you ideas and settings and mood for the insidiousness of the mythos and how it's everywhere in the world and everywhere you don't want to be. So, Call of Cthulhu, a very venerable game. I'm glad to see that it's getting back on its feet again. I highly recommend getting this. It is pr probably, in my opinion, one of the best horror games out there. It has spawned a variety of supplements, like I said, several of which we've already reviewed here. Miskatonic University, which is episode 2. Masks of Nyarlathotep, which is episode 16. And Delta Green, which is episode 11. Folks, I really have a soft spot in my heart for this game. It's a really good game for fear. If you have to run a special one-night adventure for Halloween, for, like, I ran a great one-night adventure on June 6, 2006 for the whole 666 theme. It went really well. It's really just a lot of fun. I really recommend this very highly. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at knweagle at yahoo.com. For Game Geeks, I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Good day and good gaming.